Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this chit chat with Carla McNeil and Bill Hansbury. Bill, welcome. It's a real pleasure to have you uh, joining me this evening for tonight's chit chat. Thanks, Carla. It's exciting to be with you. Great. So you're joining us from Adelaide in Australia this evening. Is that right? Correct. Fantastic. What's the weather doing there? It's absolutely stunning at the moment. We've got a bit of rain, I think, coming tomorrow, but it is, it, it's beautiful. Great stuff. And you're telling me you're not in lockdown? No, we're not, but it's a it's a day-by-day -day proposition. We've had a few uh, scary moments of truck drivers going through and testing positive, so we, we kind of all know at some point it's it's going to drop, but we'll enjoy it while we can. Yeah, absolutely. Bill, it's a real pleasure to have you join us this evening as we yeah. celebrate Dyslexia Awareness Month. And um, we're working at Learning Matters this month to really raise awareness of what dyslexia is the impact of dyslexia and to really build people's knowledge and understanding so that they can move to that place of being more empathetic and then of course reach that ultimate of taking evidence-based actions. That so is. I'd just like to kick off by uh, introducing you to everybody and sharing a little bit about who you are and what you do um, at Fullerton House. So Bill is a husband, father, mentor, teacher and author. He lives in Adelaide, as I've mentioned, in Australia with his wife, Christy Lee, and three children, Lawson, Miller and Judd. Bill works in the private practice at Fullerton House and mentors young people who live with a wide range of challenges such as learning differences, disabilities, emotional or behavioural difficulties and young people who are just doing it tough. Alongside this work, Bill has the privilege of supporting and mentoring teachers, school leaders and parents, assisting them to work together to meet the needs of these students. Bill specialises at Fullerton House in teaching students with dyslexia and offers training for schools in the area of specific learning differences, running the popular Teaching Students with Dyslexia, and I'm going to say the TSD Bill because I always well see that popping up and I yeah. love it, <laughs> uh, the TSD suite of trainings and I recently just saw on your page the TSD 2 had just been completed by a group of teachers. That's right. Um, for those wishing to work as specialist multi sensory literacy teachers. Bill has co-authored um, the Playbury Dyslexia Solutions multi-sensory literacy program with Alison Playford. Playbury is used in, school, in schools and centres across Australia as a tier three intervention program. And Bill has also developed the Word Cracker suite of morphology resources with Sally Andrew that, that many of you might have, have um, become aware of. Bill advocates for evidence-based teaching of reading and spelling in schools and better recognition of specific learning differences. He is featured in the Australian Dyslexia documentary, Outside the Square, and the upcoming Code Red, Read My Frustration feature program. Bill is widely recognised for his in-depth knowledge about behaviour management, restorative justice, and cultural renewal in educational settings. He's well known for his passion for relational teaching, strategic community building and circle time, as well as his unique and engaging style in facilitating professional learning workshops for schools, school clusters and other organisations. Bill is passionate about helping young people to better connect with their educational experience, as well as working with his teaching colleagues to help them discover or rediscover the thrill of helping young people reach their potential. But at the heart of everything that Bill does is the belief that relationships, performance and learning are inseparable. And that without a focus on strengthening relationships in organisations and schools, human performance will suffer. Wow, Bill, it is an absolute pleasure to have you here. You must sit there and think, gee, that is so cool. Oh, Carla, I, I think I need to shorten that spiel, but thank you. You made it sound really good. It's a wonderful <laughs> spiel, and it, I think it's a great representation of the contribution that you make to this, um, particularly this space of um, specific learning differences. So, Bill, I wondered if we might begin our chit-chat this evening by hearing your perspective around what you see is potentially, um, I'm going to start with the problem or the pain yep. point or the area of challenge that you observe in the education system when it comes to supporting our children with reading difficulties and dyslexia. Well, Carla, look, it's a lot better than it used to be. I think um, 
you know, 10, 12, 15 years ago, it, it was a hot mess and now it's not so much of a hot mess, but it's still a bit messy. Um, I think the problem, uh, the, the awareness around dyslexia has certainly gone up and that has been, um, I think, largely due to, uh, a, a, in, in Australia and abroad, um, a, a really good collection and organisation of uh, mums of dyslexic kids. And over here, it's, you know, it, it started off very humbly and in Australia, it's now code red. Um, so a very angry group of mums who said, we're not going to have this anymore, have put pressure mm. on schools and schools are more aware of specific learning difficulties like dyslexia. But the main difficulty is still um, poor teacher training. Um, when I trained as a teacher well, a long time ago now, there was just nothing in there about how to teach children to read and spell. And I talked to a lot of young uh, pre-service and early career teachers and nothing seems to have changed. Um, the universities uh, don't seem to be moving fast enough. Mm. Um, so as soon as you're in a conversation about dyslexia, you're in a conversation about how we teach kids to read from the get-go, aren't you? Um, Absolutely. So um, it's just, yeah, I, I think that's our main difficulty and I don't know what is making universities so slow to move on this. Um, but, but they are. Uh, Carla, have you ever read what Mark Seidenberg's got to say about this mm. issue? Yeah, mm. uh, Seidenberg in language at the speed of sight is spot on and he, he kind of makes the claim and I think it's fairly accurate that we in education tend to be, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, tend to be highly fashion driven uh, and keep science and research at an arm's length. Um, and when you get young teachers or early career teachers come out and they're not well trained, they don't know a good program from a bad one. Mm. Uh, they don't know. They don't know what happens in the brain when. And I didn't know this. Uh, don't know what happens in the brain when children learn to read and spell. So they are um, prone to programitis and and to use your wonderful term, snake oil. Mm. Yeah. So when when we get that bit of the picture. Uh, when that improves, I don't know when it will. You know, if I could wave my magic wand and rebuild teacher training from the ground up, I'd sure give it a crack. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I think that's one of the one of, yeah. So one of the conversations that I often have around that is the fact that um, you know we have this sort of um, lifespan as teachers, right? So you begin in your teacher training, and during your teacher training, you go out into schools and you participate in practice teaching experience yeah. to kind of earn your stripes to then be able to go on so the teacher training component is that initial piece and then there's that when you go and you get your first post and you have a job that that um, things really become real and so I agree with you around the teacher training but I also wonder um, about actually the pressure coming back the, from the other direction too from schools to be yeah. requesting that the right theory and um, the right research is taught um, because you could go in still and uh, potentially learn all about the science of reading in your mm. teacher training. But if you went out to a school and they weren't practicing, um, they weren't practicing in a way that it, that abided to um, the principles and elements of the science of reading. I don't know that they would um, necessarily come out with the same you know, gold standard teaching ability. And that's kind of what I sometimes find myself saying to school principals. Well, yeah, we're all responsible for this, the teacher training. And, um, but then there's that, there's that um, challenge around, well, not all school principals are aware of this like we are and haven't no. had that experience and haven't been teachers who have been lucky like us to be able to um, come to the light. Yes, yes. Um, the principles, all, well, like anything, the principles always make the difference. And you're right. Um, when when we um, take groups of students through places like Bentley West Primary School in Victoria, and now we've mm. got uh, a couple of local schools here in South Australia that have been inspired by Bentley West. Whenever I come across an early career teacher, I, I can't help but say you mm. don't know how lucky you are to be here. What a huge advantage yeah. you have with this being your first run at it. Um, because, yeah, it's, it's, it's hit and miss where you mm -hmm. end up. And I remember my teaching of reading, oh, well, it was non-existent, um, but when I was on prax, it was whole language or, whole, or balanced literacy being the main, you know, being the main driver. So um, 
I just didn't get it. Uh, so mm. that a lot of these teachers, if they, they're lucky enough to end up in a school where the science of reading is really taken off and these schools have this really tight way of teaching, they understand what they understand how to teach structured synthetic phonics, they've got tight scope and sequence, they've got mm. low curriculum variants. They just, that, that, I, I don't think they know. What, they, I think they know. That, hmm, I tell them, but I'm not sure they know what they're in. They'd probably yeah. go to their next school and think, gee, this is really different. Why, why doesn't this happen anyway? So what we've kind of said in that little piece is around the importance of teacher training which yeah. um, and, and, and teacher education. And then I want to add to that, that whole understanding of the lifespan of being a teacher, you know, and that we start to learn and then that's got to continue. Um, but if we're really going to... Um, as parents, and I've shared with you earlier that I'm a, parent, mm. a, a dyslexic um, boy, I can't, I don't even know if I can call him a boy anymore at nearly 19, that's probably yeah, not right, man. right? <laughs> he looks like a man now too, yeah. so I might need to let that parenting part, part of, you know, thinking he's a child go. Um, but I think, yeah, the important point to note there is that for parents that we do have to have empathy for teachers because they haven't had this training and it's not like it's readily available. You know, I know you you work really hard across Australia to provide quality training in this area for teachers mm -hmm. at whatever place on the lifespan of their teaching career yeah. because they didn't get it previously. So I yeah. just want to say that that's something I think we have to be really aware of so if we you know given that situation that we are still battling and you're battling in Australia and we're still battling in New Zealand um, we are very fortunate to you know you talked about code red uh, we have lifting literacy Aotearoa in New Zealand which is a group of um, um, people who give up their time to really advocate for evidence-based literacy instruction in New Zealand um, but really, we need to be thinking about how do we support those teachers and parents as they endeavour to make a bigger difference to support those children. So where could we, what could we sort of be recommending, particularly this month, for those parents and teachers mm. who want to know more about supporting their, their children and their students? I, I really... I'm just looking at my notes here, Carla. There's so, oh, crikey, there's so much I could say about this. Um, I'll start with parents, I guess. Uh, and, and unfortunately, not all parents are in a position to do this. Um, but the assessment piece. Um, that youngsters knowing that it's this thing called dyslexia is, is in, in my experience, incredibly important because mm. kids, when they see themselves struggle, they'll, look, they'll come to conclusions all on their own. And, and if they don't understand the reason why they're falling behind in their reading and their spelling, well, they'll decide they're stupid. And a colleague of once, a, a, a colleague of mine, a very important mentor by the name of Mark Lemezra, uh, said to me, he said, Bill, you need to say to kids, look, you've got to make your mind up. You're either dyslexic or you're dumb because you can't be both at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> nice. And that's, a, that's really rough around the edges. But um, I see a lot of parents who do have the means to get an identification and they worry about labelling their kids. Well, they can rest assured that kids will label themselves mm. yeah, um, nice. if, if no one explains this to them. So for parents, don't, don't shy away from explaining what dyslexia is. Um, and I think uh, because these kids are bright, depending on their age, though, they need to understand this is a different organisation in the brain. It's not their fault. Um, mm. we human beings tend to take responsibility for all sorts of things that we had nothing to do with and um, so they need to know it's it's the way the neurons organize when they were when they were in mum's in mum's tummy for lack of a better term um, and that it is a different organization uh, and that you know I, I, a lot of parents I understand because they they know this hurts their kids there's a lot of talk about dyslexia being a uh, superpower or know that sort of thing I, I don't tend to buy into it much I mm. think one of the best messages we can give to kids is look it's this thing it's called dyslexia you may have some really um look you may have some incredible talents that we'll see later on but I'll tell you what dyslexia dyslexia will do uh it'll it'll teach you to be the hardest worker in any room and school's going to be the hardest part of the journey mm. but when school's done um, and you have developed that habit of being the hardest worker in the room, boy, oh, boy, you're going to be off. You're going to fly. Mm. Um, you know, and, and, and saying on the whole parent thing, I think we, 
we do need to acknowledge uh, for, for, for our kids that it is really hard and it's not fair. You know, it's not fair that these kids, if they're lucky enough to have extra support, it's still not fair that they have to go there. For the kids that come and see me, it's not fair that they have to mm. be picked up from school or if it's after school, do another do another hour of hard slogging and multi-sensory intervention. So I think we get to say to these kids, do you know what, it's not fair. Mm. And sometimes I say to kids, go on, say it's not fair. You know, when, when they're throwing themselves there, I think their little pity party, they're allowed to throw every now and then. I say, come on, say it's not fair. And I say quietly, oh, it's not fair. And I go, come on, say it with me. <laughs> it's not fair. Go, it's not fair. And I go, do you know what, it's not fair. But, yeah. You know, this is the hand you've been dealt and we've just got mm. to get on with it, don't we? You know, yeah, we do. We do. Yeah. 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 Alison, I, I think, I think, I think, and I speak from my own experience here, you know, particularly as mothers, we want to protect our children. Of course. And, yeah. and I get that. But as you're talking, two words really spring to mind for me that I've observed in my own son, and that is perseverance and resilience. Yeah. yeah. And I am so grateful for those two attributes that he has developed. Um, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. We don't talk about superpowers. I don't believe in that approach to this. Mm. I believe in reality. I believe yep. in facing and confronting shit as it crops up, basically, yep. because I think that helps our kids to see that this is how we work through this. We, That's right. you know, and name it to tame it to normalize it kind of situation. Like name it to tame it to normalize it. Yeah. Right. I'm if just going to that one away. If you don't, like if you don't name it, how can you tame it and then normalize it? Because they, these experiences that they have when they feel like that, they are normal experiences for children who face difficulties. And it's no different, is it, for if you sign up for a soccer team and you can't kick the ball, yeah. you know, you've got to persevere and be resilient and build that skill. And I, yeah. You do. Um yeah, that look, Carla. I'm, I, I say all this from the cheap seats because I'm not parenting any children with dyslexia, dyslexia, and and I will never know what it's like to do so. Mm. I've been, you know, I've been lucky enough to be invited into the lives of plenty of parents who are parenting dyslexic kids, but we we um we really do need to to work in a way with them that um I, I yes, they're allowed to feel sorry for themselves every now and then because it's, it's a hell of a slog, you know, we get this, um, but we've all seen kids who um, I think can be over modicoddled and, and mm. overly sympathised with them and they end up being no good with themselves or anybody either. So it's about understanding and, and it's yeah. a real balance, isn't it, I'm sure. Mm. Yeah. yeah, totally, as much as we struggle with that word balance on many fronts, this one is okay. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and, on the, and on the teachers thing, uh, it's not their fault either. Um, yeah. When I talk to teachers, my main teachers feel very guilty, uh, Carla, when mm. they uh, first come across science of reading and, and start to get some runs on the board, whether they're working in intervention or whether they've just embraced the science of reading in their classroom. And they see very quickly uh, how effective this teaching is, this whole multisensory structured cumulative mm. thing. Uh, and they feel very guilty that they haven't yeah. been doing this since the beginning. And, and, and it's do important you, to say, do you that's right. And do you experience that they they seem to go through somewhat of a grieving process and Absolutely. they name children that they've previously or students that they've yes. previously taught? And well, I think that's a really tough thing for them too, because they need time to come to terms with the fact that, you know, they've potentially or not knowingly been shortchanged, but no. but I do observe that that they go through a real sense of grief and um it's tough. Yeah, I remember feeling it myself. I didn't have a clue what I was doing in the classroom around teaching kids to read. I, um, so everyone kind of puts their head in their hands and goes, oh, what did I do to these kids, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but, uh, they're, they're, you know, the teaching profession here and, and where you are, and, and if you listen to Seidenberg in the UK and the US and other, other developed countries where all the victims are fairly shabby. Mm. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So then for teachers thinking about you know um how teachers might get started obviously there's lots of things that they could be um thinking about but if yep. there is a teacher sitting out there listening into us this evening what would your sort of key recommendation be for them in terms of where would they begin to build their knowledge well there's probably a couple of ways to look at this i was lucky enough 
to have a colleague say to me, you need to go and do this TSD training. Before I used to run it, I'd trained in it. Uh, and this same person, Karen Hodson, who's a psychologist now, one of the other directors at Fullerton House, told me to read Overcoming Dyslexia by Sally Shagwitz, which is an incredibly important work. Mm. So, look, I, I tend to read a bit. When I get onto something new, I'll, I'll pick up everything I can on the area and I'll read. Now, not all of us have got the time to do that. So, um, if teachers are in schools and they get the sense that their intervention teacher, if the school has an intervention program, if they just get the sense the intervention teacher is using multi-sensory structured programs like, you know, anything from the Macquarie suite of programs or talk to them, um, just, just ask them about, you know, how, how does their teaching differ? How can they help their kids in the classroom? Now, if the teacher's doing something, you know, uh, sorry, if the intervention is something useless like reading recovery, don't bother. Um, but start asking questions um mm. there is look if covid's given us one thing it has been absolutely absolutely incredible. Yeah. absolutely it's amazing so people can, yeah so people can jump on and look at um you know the reading league uh incredible folks like david kilpatrick are all over youtube mm. mark seidenberg i was listening to, to him talk about comprehension the other night you, you know so there's oh gee there's really no getting out of it without mm. reading or viewing. Absolutely. So really what you're saying there is that asking questions. So yep. um, number one is if you have an intervention in place in your school, go and yep. sit with that teacher or yes. have the teacups and ask them, you know. I think that's a really good place to start too because, you know, New Zealand is the home of reading recovery. So we have quite a lot of it dotted around the place still. Mm. And mm. so actually developing some understanding of what is going on in intervention in our school yep. is a really important place for a tier one classroom teacher to begin their questioning, because if they begin to adopt a multi-sensory um, literacy approach and we're sending that child out for an intervention in reading recovery, we've got this real disconnect going on that's not yeah. going to be healthy for that child. So sitting and asking those questions is going to be a wonderful place for them to start. And then, yeah, I agree. Get into, you know, looking into some of those um, links that you've mentioned. Get onto the Reading League on um, Facebook page. And there are so many others. And we'll pop a few in our thread. Yes. Um, and the, the, code, the Code Red website is fantastic. Uh, you know, Australia's equivalent of the Reading League uh, is mm. five from five. You know, it's... Um, yes. Yes, yeah. so it, it, this, this area is growing. There's no doubt, there's yeah. no doubt about it. Um, just adding to what I said before, look, if, if, the, if the child is getting an external to the school intervention and they know it is an evidence-based intervention, engage with that specialist teacher or tutor. Um, I, I find some, you know, sometimes teachers really resent that kids are getting outside mm. support. Mm. Uh, but, and sometimes teachers say, tell me what we can do here to yeah. help. You know? And we've yeah. seen both. But, you know, that, that can be someone outside the school. Just mm. ask them to explain what they're doing. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Well, I'd really like to go now into talking about multi-sensory learning mm. and why it is crucial to develop the various memory systems. Because I'm not sure that this is so widely understood to the extent that it needs to be for us to really go the extra mile to improve our teaching practice in particular yep. and ensure that we have all of those um, all of those areas supported to build long-term memory. Yes. Um, one of our national treasures here, uh, Bartek Rakowski, mm -hmm. uh, says in Outside the Square in his beautifully considered academic way he says I don't think we quite understand just how important multi-sensory mm. learning is that's he's loosely quoted but he's spot on um, so multi-sensory is all about this visual auditory and kinesthetic um, the, the the older literature on dyslexia talks about three learning channels and so when I talk to kids about this I say to them look when we remember something, when we store something in memory, if we can store it to three channels to, 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 our, to our, kinesthetic, our sense of touch, our kinesthetic movement, to, uh, to vision, I'm always very cautious. I don't like to use visual. I prefer the mm. term graphic, but, but it's what you see. Yeah. You can see yeah. it, hear it, say it, and, and think about your articulation of it at the same time. What, what we tend to do is build 
uh, more resilient and flexible memory of it. Um, and it really gets up kids' noses, this whole multisensory bit, because when kids are doing their, their, for instance, their spelling card drills in the Playberry program, they don't want to do, you know, I'll say at and I'll say at is a, but they don't want to do the talking out loud bit with mm. the tutor sheets. They're very resistant to it. You can understand because they come from the classroom where they want to keep all this stuff on the down low. Mm. So I find myself having to explain to them this, this three memory system stuff. Um, one, of the, one of the books I read along the way was The Brain That Changes Itself uh, by Norman Doidge. Now, I didn't, wasn't all that big a fan about what he had to say about fast for word, but mm. uh, one thing that came out of that book was neurons that fire together, wire together. So I say to the kids, when we activate these different neural networks around saying, seeing, hearing, writing at the same time, they support each other. There's a great example, one of the, when we get to teaching kids uh, ways to learn irregularly spelled words, Alison Playford, my colleague, the other half of Playberry, developed this pro process called the eight-step multisensory method, where basically kids learn words with irregular spellings through a say it, spell it, hear it, spell mm -hmm. it out loud, write it routine. And when we come to test these kids on these words, I'll commonly see, I'll say, okay, for instance, the word is um, said, a really easy one, but you know. <laughs> So, so students will, my kids will, unless prompted, just go to write it straight away because they, uh, they're nervous about forgetting. So they'll mm. engage the hand and the vision immediately. And uh, often they'll get halfway through and what will let them down is the orthography. They're looking at it and they'll rub it out and they'll go, now listen, cover it up, look at me, look away, I want you to spell said out loud because part of the eight step is they have to spell the word out loud using letters. So they'll, they'll cover it and bang, they'll say S-A-I-D said and i'll go now write that but on you can never miss a chance you've got to say to them now what happened there was your orthographic representation of that word fell over you looked at it and you didn't know where the a and the i went but it's a good thing you part of that learning was saying s-a-i-d mm -hmm. so they learned that one memory system for lack of a better term came in and rescued the day and sometimes it's the opposite thing but when i guess when when you do the whole the whole multi-sensory gig don't miss a chance to explain to kids how one memory system came in and saved the day. With our kids, it's typically auditory memory that lets them down or auditory yeah. verbal memory. Um, so that, that's a really important bit. We need to explain to kids why we get them to do this irritating routine of say it, see it, spell it aloud, say it, write it, mm. yeah. I'm, I'm finding here in New Zealand that with the adoption of a structured literacy approach, Bill, teachers are beginning to understand why that's important to, yep. to also build um, a support network when those students are away at writing time. If we've built up that sort of VAK or that mm -hmm. system of you know, saying that word and then isolating it into sound and then, you know, they've got letter you know, formation. Phone name fingers and that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then they've got that automated letter to sound correspondence from a kinesthetic perspective. Um, those students are going to be so much more able when it comes to the increased cognitive task of writing. Well, they are because it, automat it automatizes these processes so much faster. Mm. Um, I was lucky enough to take a group of teachers through a local school here called Salisbury Primary School who were inspired about four years ago by Bentley West, you know, and um, they are just going gangbusters. And this is, a, this is a disadvantaged school. This is over here. They call it a category two disadvantage, which is, up, you know, category one is okay. the highest you can get. And watching these kids do the, the whole multisensory bit, the choral response, mm. um, the, as well as being incredibly effective teaching, this teaches kids about how memory works, how, yeah. how we get stuff from the fridge into the freezer <laughs> or short-term into long-term memory. You know, kids need to understand that repetition is the only way mm. into permanent storage and their yeah. automaticity. I so, love that. When we, when yeah, you know, look, I'm I'm quite a fan of it too. And when I'm talking to the kids in intervention I work with, um, they're dealing with a short memory shelf for what they hear. It's a memory shelf that very easily drops sound. So our kids mm. need to understand that repetition is important. This is the reason so much of our revision has this multiple exposure stuff built in. Um, and I think it's an important message too because this stuff doesn't doesn't improve memory. The research tells us if you're if you've got a short memory shelf, if you don't have 
much working memory capacity, then there's really nothing that'll fix that. But we'll teach kids strategies. Mm. You know, I, yeah. I, say to, I say to youngsters, do you know if you want to remember something, you've got to repeat it over and over. You know, I say, when I go to the shops and my wife says I need to get milk, uh, some onions and whatever else, when I'm walking out the door, I'm saying milk, onions, tea, milk, onions, tea. And a lot of our kids aren't aware of the need to repeat. Absolutely. And so, yeah. And do you do this too? Do you do the milk, onions, fingers. tea? Yeah, see, oh, I do absolutely. that. Absolutely. I do that because then I know I've got to get three things. That's right. And I will always then, through my repetition, I will always associate I've got the milk, I've got the onions. Oh, what's uh, it? Yes. Yeah, That's so right. I do. I have that really like physical memory hook too yes. and it works every time Doesn't i couldn't it? say that i'd remember seven things but um, <laughs> <laughs> no but the repetition no, that. and that does yes. it really really helps i'm a huge writer on my hand i say to kids listen uh, if you don't want to forget something uh well i don't tell my kids to write in their hands i can get in trouble with their parents but i say um do you keep post-it do you keep post-it notes near you do you, do you keep stickies around and i say mm. if you really really want to remember something write it on a post-it note and put it in your put it in your undies drawer <laughs> is uh you know unless you don't change your undies you should be good but um that might help the undies get off the floor of the bed into well the you never too, know right it. yeah, yeah. Um, secret strategy <laughs> that's right you reminded me you know the ancient greeks were doing this stuff when when we when the you know the great the greeks were the great orators and and weren't really big into writing you know they uh, they would learn things like memory rooms and memory palaces and mm. you know, the, the supercharged version of what you're talking about. I've got three things to remember. I'll keep it on my fingers. And, mm. and I think we really underestimate the, the power of teaching kids about how memory works. And I yeah. think teachers as well. I got next to nothing about memory systems. Again, we bag and teach mm. training, but didn't get a whole lot there. Yeah. And if we are able to create those tier one classroom environments where that's how we operate, um, through through knowing about good quality explicit instruction, yes. then we will have more students who are able to participate and um, and achieve yes. in our regular classrooms. You know, we have yes. we have a real reluctance, I believe, in New Zealand to remove students for intervention, and I know that you have a really strong view on this, oh, which bonkers. I yeah yeah it is bonkers. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that there is, because we have w what we talk about as an inclusive, we try to build inclusive learning environments, mm. but there is no way in a truly, um, there's no way that we can truly cater to no all of those. No way. Um, yep. Um, it, it, um, Carla, it, it, it is crazy making when I hear principals uh, talk about this inclusive, um, you know, we intervene in the classroom stuff. You and I know these kids with intervention in the classroom, uh, if they're willing to accept it, a number one treading water, it is not an intervention. It mm. is being scribed for, it is not working on the core difficulty. Absolutely. Um, you know, and there's nothing more excluding than a kid who's 12 years old with a decoding age of five and a half, you know. So I, I, mm. I don't pull any punches with principals about that. You cannot intervene in classrooms and it puts a lot of burden on teachers as well. One of the things we need to say to teachers is you cannot remediate a dyslexic student. You can understand, you can use evidence-based teaching practice, which is, which will make their life a lot easier. But the, the job of remediation is not a classroom gig. Mm. <clears throat> and that's where in New Zealand, we're really working hard in lots of different avenues to build up evidence of what uh, evidence-based um, yeah. instructions instruction and intervention looks like and yes. the difference that's making yes. and we really are starting to to make small traction but really really good traction in that space right across New Zealand which is which is really really exciting have you got your um lighthouse beacon schools that are um, absolutely we have yeah, yeah. Good, and their data yeah yeah, light yeah. and and you know and you know last week we had um we had one of those schools uh, up here on um, our one of our national news um, cool. events. Yeah, and, and actually working with our uh, Māori and Pacifica students and showing the impact for those students. Yes. yes. Because that's always been an area that, that the, it's been really hard to shift the data in. So definitely there's some really wonderful shining lights across the country in terms of the yeah. difference they're making. And we just want to bottle that up more so. Oh, and and yes. that's where um, Lifting Literacy Aotearoa does such a wonderful job of celebrating those case studies of those schools 
tools and and um, sharing that data and advocating at government level. So yeah, Carla, yeah. just before we, there's something important to say about this. Just before we move on, um, and I've, I've got a blog almost done about this. When people that haven't seen this teaching go into these classrooms. It often horrifies them because it is at huge odds to what we yeah. learned around constructivist learning styles. We actually mm-hmm. see kids often in rows doing mm-hmm. choral response, doing multiple repetition, and people look at that, well, some people do, particularly people with a really strong inquiry uh, mm. uh, bent, look at that and go, this is just rote. And Kilpatrick says it beautifully. There are some things that you just need to learn through paired associate learning. Yeah. You don't inquire your way to a phonic code. But, um, you know, I think people like you and I have to be saying to people, look, yeah, this is really structured because this is keeping mm-hmm. in mind stuff like cognitive load, repeated multiple Absolutely. and attention. You yeah. Know, I, I see these oh, far out. We've made the mistake in Australia of letting architects make decisions about what learning spaces should look like. Mm-hmm. Um, and yep. we have classrooms here without seats, without enough tables, and we mm-hmm. wonder why kids develop really poor handwriting. Yeah. Bill, I was recently in a classroom. It was a year seven and eight classroom, so that's like 12, 13-year-olds, or 11, 12, 13-year-olds, and <clears throat> uh, this is of what, so we call it a low decile, where it's um, children who might come from less privileged yeah. families or... Yeah. Uh, and there was this gorgeous Māori boy sitting in the back of the classroom who was really reluctant to participate in the teacher's lesson. And it was a um, shared teaching situation where the teacher was beginning to teach her lesson, and then I was coming in from a coaching perspective to help her carry the lesson on to to, um, co-teach with her. And we got to the end of the lesson, and this boy sat up in his chair. Uh, The principal was in the uh, class as well, and he turned around to me and he said, Miss! Man, I'm going to apply to Harvard now. Oh, bless him. <laughs> How good so is that? It was. It was really cool. And the principal was blown away because he is a very disengaged student. Yeah. And they had seen slowly over time that with the adoption of a very explicit approach to teaching, yeah. spelling, and reading, that he was really starting to participate more in the learning. And We talked about this extensively afterwards and the impact for other students. But once we take away the barriers and it's very clear and systematic and step by step, not only do students have greater success, but what I experience is that teachers are grateful for the direction. Yes. Yes. And, And they really feel that they truly are empowered by knowing that they are actually teaching those students. They get physical responses. They get emotional responses, let alone what the spreadsheet says. Yes. And with this type of teaching, this diagnostic teaching, that feedback is built in. Um, This, you know, a lot of schools that I've watched over here use the the, the EDI model, the explicit instruction, the the pop sticks, the calling on the non-volunteers or the cold calling. Um, but you see, what kids love about this is number one, the predictability, and number two, they're not going to be chucked in a situation Absolutely. where they haven't been taught what they're mm. being asked to do. Mm. So it, the success is built in because the teaching is just so good. Mm. And just going back to what you were saying, sort of to start with around, you know, you sort of taken aback when you first of all come into a classroom that does have a structured approach. Yeah. I recall for the very first time going into a school in Perth where this teaching was taking place. And uh, it was a school that Lorraine Hammond... Oh, I knew you were going to say that. Yes. ...has been working alongside. And I can tell you, I, um, coming from New Zealand, I I had a physical response to what I first experienced in that classroom. Yes, and yes. I was someone who was potentially a little bit further ahead in terms of my knowledge and knowing about some of this practice. So yes. you're dead right when you say yes. that, you know, because you you are quite taken aback. And, and I was physically, and I thought, oh, my goodness, it was this, I don't know that this would ever be adopted in yes. New Zealand. And yet, you know, then we learn more. And and so I think knowledge truly is power when it yes, comes it to when it comes to thinking about adopting a, and um, evidence based pedagogies and practices. You know, yes. um, and I think that what really helped me to understand that practice was then being able to lean into the conversations about why this practice is important, what this practice brings to the table in terms of ensuring every student becomes successful, what it does for teachers, what it does for school leaders, and what it does for that whole community of learners. Yes. It's just 
that's so empowering. It, it, look, that's a great word. This is I, this is social justice in action. Really. Yeah. Um, it, it, Carl, it's, I've got this concern that um, our community, despite the fact that um, that these schools are, and I love it, I love it when uh, these these complex schools in complex places um, are creating reading results that are walloping the leafy mm -hmm. greens, you know, and it's happening everywhere. Yeah. But I, I'm noticing a pushback the other day. Uh, there was an article from uh, a chap I won't, I obviously won't name him, but it was having a crack at Sweller's cognitive load theory. Um, and I think we're going to see a, a pushback from, oh, I, is it fair to say the constructivists? I don't know. There are folks out there who have made a lot of money peddling all sorts of garbage around mm, uh, learner right. engagement, edutainment, um, how learning should always be fun. And I think, I think these folks are about to get on the front foot and start picking away at these mm -hmm. practices that we know are incredibly uh, evidence-backed. Um, they're just great teaching. Yeah. Um, I hope it's not the case, but I think we're going to find ourselves having to unfairly justify Mm. Um, this style of teaching because this is not this is not the stuff you see on the side of the buses you know you when schools are marketing themselves you're seeing this free range colorful furniture kids holding all sorts of devices on the move mm. um i hope one day some of our absolutely you know, well you know when you, that, when you say that what springs to mind is the great maths teaching that happens and i don't recall the name of the school in the uk but you know all of this could be said for how we how we potentially could be making a difference in mathematics education as oh, well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, and, and, and fundamentally that comes back to what we know about the function of the brain, right? You know, all of these things about what we're talking about, multi-sensory teaching and learning, all yes. of these things about cognitive load theory, all of these things about memory chambers yes. are exactly the same in a mathematics yes. approach. Uh, they are, and this is a natural progression I see in the schools mm. that start off in the reading. They very quickly move into the, into the yeah. Exercise construction of maths yeah um Bent bentley west again are doing incredible things if you follow david Mulcunis mm. or michael mckinnon uh you have a look at the way they very um uh, methodically use their uh, their retrieval practice the way they mm. space out revisions of certain facts it, it is something to behold but boy oh boy are those kids. yeah it's exciting it is yeah. exciting and you're dead right what we see here is those schools those lighthouse schools who are now really well versed in this practice they are seeking that in mathematics in new zealand yes. and and that's exciting so um, it's, it's wonderful to see this incredible maths teaching coming from this orton gillingham base yeah yeah um, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I guess it's about that. that. It's the direction, isn't it? I think that's what, for me, I think, what is it about that? Yes. But I'd like to think too that there is, because to me that alone is not enough. I think it's about the combination of knowing about executive function. It's about yes. knowing about the memory that's aspect. Right. It's about knowing about um, the components of explicit instruction that help me to be able to um, retrieve now that we know so much about yes. the importance of retrieval and, and and I guess in the science of reading, that's what the cognitive psychology research has offered us, yes. that we don't have that direct mirror in mathematics just yet, maybe, but, you know, who knows, perhaps in time we'll see some great research coming out in that area. That's, well, I, think, I think we can't not see it. Mm. I think we'll see it very soon, but these things always take a while. But um, yeah. you know, if, if you see the incredible uh, results coming out of these schools, well, that, that's, that's the start of your data. Mm, so yeah. exciting. Yeah. When we think about comprehension, mm. just to kind of flip back to reading. Yes. So you, you will be heard to say that decoding is the bedrock of comprehension. Yes. Tell us so, a little bit why about why you would say that. Look, I, I've updated that. Oh, um, that, that's exciting. Look, it is. Um, look, PA, phonological awareness or, or phoneme proficiency is probably the bedrock. I, I said that in, in my rant. Um, mm. <laughs> so at that point, um, you know, we, people like you and I were really trying to justify why um, uh, forced guessing, three queuing uh, type of word identification techniques were just um at, in, in at very best useless and at worst completely damaging to kids so i think i said something like decoding has become the forgotten uh, stepchild of word recognition um but you see that's decoding is part of a bigger picture 
at the end of the day, it's about permanent word storage, isn't it? It's about yeah. orthographic mapping. Yeah. Um, so decoding is part of that chain, but we know we need kids to be to be proficient in this incredibly artificial and fake and non-existent but existent skill of being able to get phonemes on their own. Mm-hmm. Uh, we need kids to be proficient at that, so we need to be training in phoneme awareness straight away, which then makes kids uh, able to use decoding to start to permanently store those, what is it, between 30 and kind of 70,000 words. Yeah that they're going to need. So when kids are orthographically mapping, when the self-teaching kicks off, then the cognitive space is free to do mm. all those wonderful comprehension strategies, you're like monitoring your understanding, et cetera, et cetera. So look, the bedrock is probably phoneme awareness. If mm. you want. Um, and then but, when, as you're talking, Bill, for me, it's like, you know, it's kind of building on. Yeah, that's, that's, that's right. what's happening as you're talking it it's building on because and it's kind of cyclical isn't it you know as you move through a scope and sequence um that you're always coming back to that phonemic awareness I think that's something that I was probably a little bit slow to learn yeah me too I was Yeah. yeah I was really kind of slow to learn that I and I think that we want to be really cautious particularly when we have older dyslexic students that we don't see that as a baby skill no no, it's it's incredibly important. I was very deliberate when I um, did my talk over here for our wonderful literacy guarantee unit that I had a boy who uh, was he was sixteen at that point, and I'm you know doing Kilpatrick's one minute activities mm. with him because you don't skip that step. Yeah, and and, and that's that's isn't that funny? We we kind of. Um, we get enculturated in this teaching stuff that goes, well, surely there's a shortcut around this. Surely we don't have to make kids mm. at this age sound out. And surely we don't need to work on such low-level skills. But there's just no way around it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because what we want teachers to understand is that they're building those neurons. So you said before about, you know, building um, all the wiring and the firing. We literally yeah. need to wire those neurons up and, and build yes. that reading circuit in the brain. Um, which is liter- literally developed through working on it. It's not just going to happen. That's right. We've got to bring that job of reading over from the right to the left. Mm. Um, it's, it's something else we talk to kids about. Yeah. Sally Shea, which has given us a mm. wonderful gift, that, that beautiful cutaway diagram of the brain, mm. which, you know, which shows what in typically developing readers, how, the, how, how reading will normalise this isn't the word because reading has never been a normal endeavour for the That's brain. That's right. But, but mm. how we have these... Um, these better networks that do a better job so a good intervention brings brings the job over primarily to the left yeah Mm. this is the only way we get there we've got it had a couple of questions come through bill Mm. so and one of the questions is around um here in new zealand our government call dyslexia a learning difference rather than than a learning disability and this um person Catherine is wondering what's how does that work in Australia is it called a learning disability is it recognized as a learning disability and then yes she's sort uh, of wondering if that's part and parcel of what the problem is potentially in getting universities and teacher training on yeah it can be look whether it's called a disability a difference or a disorder I tend I find tends to uh change depending on what whether you're in a political space or you're in a learning space, but we have this thing called the Disability Discrimination Act. Uh, it's as old as 1992, and that does name dyslexia as a disability. Um, however, sorry, hang on. It, sorry, can you just say that to me again? In 1992. In 1992. In was, Australia. There was a dis- thing called the Disability Discrimination Act. Mm-hmm. And I hope I've got that right, which was released and it named dyslexia. Mm-hmm. I believe, as a disability. Now, I could be wrong and I could get shot, be shot saying this, but <laughs> I'm often talking to parents, um, oh, look, when, when the going, when there has to be some straight talk, the, the, D, the Disability Discrimination Act, when I say there needs to be some straight talk in schools, um, yeah. sometimes parents will say to a school, look, you are in breach of this act. So that does, I believe, name dyslexia as a disability. I prefer right. the term disorder. Mm-hmm. Um, a difference I don't think is strong enough yeah. uh, because, you know, they're, they're, I think it trivialises it. We, we, can see, we can see dyslexia in the brain now thanks to functional yeah. uh, fMRI. We mm. know there is 
there is a disorder. There is a there is a quantitative difference between how the brain processes speech sound. Mm. We see it when we put you know thousands and thousands of people into fMRI and watch them read non words, mm. and it, and it is disabling. Mm. Yes, it's more disabling in some environments than another. In a dyslexia friendly or a dyslexia aware school, it is far less disabling. In a school with three tiers of intervention, it is much much less disabling. So I guess the how much it disables a learner depends largely on context. But I don't think we should tiptoe around it. It mm. is highly disabling. It is it is lifelong. Um, even people that have been remediated will still talk about how they will get colleagues to proofread everything they put out. How how, yeah. how, how they need yeah. to read things two three times. Um, so yeah, I'd prefer to lean toward the, the the punchier language around disorder and disability. I don't think difference mm. gets the job done, Carla. Yeah, um, Bill. Just to put some perspective around the time frame and the reason I asked about the 1992, you know, was that in New Zealand dyslexia was acknowledged in 2007. Yeah. So yep. there's, you know, like it's just feels like we have this giant lag. And even then, you know, when we look from 2007 to 21, what's really happened? And I think there is a real need in New Zealand for us to actually be thinking about some real legislative requirements yep. Yep. for supporting, for recognizing, you know, like you said earlier, one of the biggest things for parents is actually assessment. And I agree with that wholeheartedly, Bill. You know, one mm. of the, th the best things that I did myself as a parent and then went on to do as a school leader was to ensure that where there was uncertainty as to why the struggle, that there was an assessment take place because we yeah. found the understanding and acceptance and then leading on to empathy that came from that was huge for yeah. all, for, ev for every one of us that was involved yes. with that student, let alone the student themselves. Yes, yes. And the schools that do this well, who screen well, um, they, so, so you know, we, we know there are schools that will screen for phoneme awareness, um, mm. you know, straight away uh, and other early markers like slow rapid naming and, and you know, they can just, they can just throw kids immediately into intervention. Absolutely. At the same time, they start to be exposed to a phonic code in a classroom. And so, so for parents going, I can't afford an assessment by an ed psych, what you can do is put pressure on your school mm. to be screening early mm. for these early markers. In Australia, we've got this insidious thing that people call the wait fail, mm. uh, you know, that says a kid needs to have a couple of years of, of quality instruction and then we need to start noticing a gap before we do anything which is another form of bonkersness bonkers <laughs> on bonkers well um, you just did yeah there it is bonkersness <laughs> um, word of the day it's bonkerish but um <laughs> we don't have to do that so you know if parents can say to schools look we can pick these kids who are at risk early mm. we can do it cheaply quickly yeah and and then it depends on the school having an intervention, but not every kid. You, know, you can you can just get stuck into an intervention whether they've mm. had a you know, whether the parents have been able to fork, fork out anything between five hundred and fifteen hundred dollars for an assessment. These schools mm. are doing it well. The, the, the need for assessment is it, yeah. When, when there's good intervention, it doesn't matter so much. It does and in my school. That's the exciting thing that's really tr um, happening right across New Zealand currently, Bill. Is that you know the in, the number of schools that have that do have screening tools in place right from the get-go is increasing every Good. week. Yes, and it, it's, it's fantastic. And then what we're observing is that that's growing awareness and then that's leading to teachers sitting down and asking questions over the teacups and, well, what does this mean if I find yes. this and how might I go about this? And so that's right. is this real sort of... Um, from the inside out um, uh, focus on how can we really raise the bar in this profession which is really pretty exciting it, isn't it? it it's yeah it, it really is it makes the hair in the back of my neck stand up yeah to hear that Me too. the same mm. thing is happening over there that's starting to happen here yeah not as quickly as we'd like yeah no? and it never will be but um but at least it is beginning to happen and um, and, and you know the other thing too sort of I think that's important here is that the importance of people being brave enough to lean into conversations you have said numerous times this evening about go and talk to your classroom teacher and for yeah. teachers to go and talk to the intervention specialist 
And I think that what we all really must realize is that the more we talk about this, the more we do. Um, yes. And I don't want to downplay it. I want to come, but I do want to come back to that. We want to normalize these discussions. And normal. Yes. And what I mean by that is saying that it's okay as a parent to go in and ask questions in the school as to how your child is being taught to read and how they're being screened and what early reading yeah. skills they do and don't have. Because if we don't yes. do that, nothing will change, right? No, it, it won't. And you see, this is a being a parent of a youngster or a 19 year old Carla who's, who's on this journey, has been on this journey, you'd, you'd understand. Mm. Uh, parents are met with um, anything ranging from absolute defensiveness right through to well let's talk you know tell me what you know and, and that depends really on I guess a teacher's shame response to to a parent asking those types of questions so all, I always say to parents look you're going to have to get this person on board and keep them on board and you can't mm -hmm. do that by walloping them yeah, yeah. Um, so you know I always I don't know where I heard this but balancing the slap and soothe <laughs> um, is what is what the parents that have, and it is parents that are still making the difference in school, and it is parents yeah. that have got the ear of policymakers here in Australia. Policymakers don't give two hoots what teachers scream from the rooftops. Mm. As soon as it's it's a collective of a voter base, and it's and it's mums and dads and grandparents of dyslexic kids rocking up on MPs' doorsteps and having the conversations. This mm. is where the traction has yeah. started to happen here. Yeah, so the message there is just keep going because there's a lot of great yeah. stuff happening over here like that. And and, and, yes. and and are they making a difference? And each each person contributes to that. Yes, they are making a difference. So it's really yeah. great to hear you saying that. It's mm. it's organized and it's drip, drip, yeah. drip, drip, drip. And mm. it's um it's yeah, but yeah, manage your slap and soothe. Now some people <laughs> don't respond to anything but a slap I find, which is you know, <laughs> metaphorically speaking. <laughs> Um, there are some systems, Carla, unfortunately, I think that will only ever um, change their approach by being, for lack mm. of a better term, embarrassed into it. Mm. Um, because we humans, we're all the same. We would probably prefer to do some, the wrong thing well than do the right thing sloppily for a while. It's, it's you know, and we're all, we all fall victim of cognitive bias and all of these. Yeah, things. yeah, absolutely. Um, mm. But uh, luckily, you know, when you have to slap soup later. <laughs> mm. And um, a question had come in around, you know, convincing, uh, how do you convince teachers who work alongside you to adopt those same kind of evidence-based practices? But I think, yeah, you model, but also yeah. your slap and soothe. Um, your slap and soothe, uh, I think, would work a treat there too. And um, there are plenty of teachers who are, who are the only ones in schools doing this mm. so you know if you're a teacher and you have gone on your own science of reading journey and you are doing stuff in your classroom that he looks at odds um just keep beetling away don't stop this people talk about whole school approaches yeah of course they're important but you don't not start because it's not absolutely mm. it, it, it is passionate teachers um who have often had a passionate mum and, and sometimes as a teacher who is a dyslexic a, a mum or a dad of a dyslexic kid these are the people that always like these guys in schools and eventually people go I couldn't help but hearing what I, you know what I, mm. I notice you do I notice you're doing this phoneme drill on, on the on the board or I can see you with the cards or you've got the kids jumping up and down and clapping mm. syllables what's going on yeah and then you just say look you just talk you just talk and and be 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 completely aware of like we talked about before the shame that all of us teachers have. Mm. We see this, and those those initial defensive responses are shame based. I get this from my background in restorative practice, but don't be put off by that first kind of oh, is that what you're doing? Mm. Oh gee, that looks old hat. Isn't that just rote learning? I'll never forget on one of the Bentley tours, I had this principal who now ironically is leading. Um, one of the one of the highest performing Catholic schools here in Adelaide mm -hmm. turned to me and said, "This is rope learning." <laughs> you no, know, it was his gut response. It was his visceral response, and I, and I had to say, yeah. you know, "What made it is? That's exactly what yeah." Because you don't some stuff you don't inquire your way to. Yeah, and we need repetition to get it in the yeah. freezer. That's right, that's right. right. Yeah, <laughs> eggs, milk, bacon, eggs, milk, bacon, eggs, milk, bacon. Yeah. yeah. And then something comes on the radio and you forget. You know, yeah, totally. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. It's been so amazing to chat with you, Bill. Like, clearly, we could sit here and talk um, all night. Let's 
think now about your top two tips. Oh, your you know top you're not two tips. Get, you know you're I not know. going to get two. Do you? Right. <laughs> Where are we? I'm all good with you being an overachiever. Oh. Okay. So your top two tips for parents and your top two tips for teachers. I'm just looking at my notes. Okay, parents, number one, if you can get your child identified, okay, um, uh, get, the, get the issue identified if you can uh, and straight talk to your child. Go and watch some of your own, you know, YouTube stuff around dyslexia. Um, the ABC over here, I was lucky enough to be part of a dyslexia video done by Behind the News by the ABC over here. Go and watch the BTN dyslexia clip. Arm yourself with knowledge so you can talk straight to your child. Obviously age appropriate, but you can talk straight to mm. them about the fact it's not their fault, but those, those tiny little electrical circuits in their brain are set up a bit differently and you're not filling them full of fluff, which kids actually are too smart for anyway. Absolutely. Superpower stuff. Um, just talk factually. Don't hide them. Don't hide it from them because they'll, they'll decide they're done. So go and arm yourself with a bit of knowledge before you talk to your child about what it is and what we're going to do about it. Uh, it's probably two things right there, uh, Carla. And if I'm going to say one more. And when you do need to get, you, you know, your kid's teacher or your kid's school on board, uh, there are going to be hard conversations. Be very aware of the shame. That, mm. that, that teachers mm. feel when you question them about their practice. So go, gently relentless is probably a term yeah, nice. that my restorative justice colleague, Margaret Thorsborn, who plenty of you folks in New Zealand know, mm. being gently relentless is, is, is the way to do this. Yeah, that's really nice. Yeah. Um, and and, the, and the teachers? teachers. Um, yes, yeah, start your journey right now. If you're the lone wolf and you're doing it on your own, don't let that stop you. Um, but just be open about your practice. Uh, over time, you'll develop a patter to explain uh, how what you're doing in certain parts of your day looks highly regimented. Um, understand that, you know, your principals and your APs and your DPs, the people above you, are probably going to feel worse than you because they get paid the bigger bucks and they don't know this. So be completely aware about people's shame response to this. But again, Gently relentless and understand, teachers, you cannot remediate kids in your classroom. I don't, I don't want you feeling as though you can save children from their dyslexia. You can understand. Mm. You can understand things about how dyslexia robs them of time. You can, you can tweak your assessment. You can give these kids more time to do stuff. You can help them use assistive software, but understand if they're adolescent, they're not going to want to use it. So you need to have some discretion. Ask kids what will help. Um, but also on the other side, um, we sometimes with some of these kids need to help them get out of their own way too. So when you know a youngster, don't be scared to give them a shove from time mm. to time either, uh, which again is a much easier said than done. It's a real balancing act. But arm yourself with knowledge. You can't save these kids. You need to be part of a system of three tiers of intervention. Um, take people on the journey. Amazing. Just take people on the journey and understand we all mm. feel completely shit about this <laughs> when you learn there's a better way to do it and we haven't been doing it. Absolutely. Wow, that's been amazing to chat with you, Bill. If people want to get in touch with you or follow your work, mm. um, I think you'll find there's a lot of people who are really familiar with, with your work already, but what is the best place for people to catch up with what you are doing and the difference that you're making right across Australia? Well, uh, on, look, on uh, my Facebook page, Hansberry Educational Consulting, I'm fairly busy on that, popping up bits and bobs, often sharing a lot of other, other people's stuff. So there's the Facebook, there's my website which is www.hansberryec for educationalconsulting.com.au. So there's bits and bobs all over that. I'm getting better at um, putting things in the right places, but some people still tell me it's a hot mess. But anyway, the <laughs> website, the, there's the, uh, yeah, the, probably the website and the business Facebook. Um, or if That's you just great. Google Bill Hansberry, you know, you'll see my mm. life going on about ranting about all sorts of stuff. I was just going to say, and I do want to just bring out, I mean, we shared your Bill's rant um, on dyslexia on our page um, a few days ago. I think that even though you did publish that a little while ago, it, is still, ago, yeah, yeah. it is still really, really valid for people, particularly those who I think are really starting out and be they a parent or be they 
a professional bill, I think it's a really, really, um, a really informative, a very honest account of um, how, how they potentially might move forward. So it's been a real honour to, to um, spend some time with you this evening. Thank you so much Thank for you. all the pearls of wisdom and um, the, the honest and frank advice that you have offered, I think, has been incredibly valuable. To everybody who's joined us for this evening, thank you so much for giving up your time to build your knowledge, to grow your awareness and to, to um, take over the baton and make a little bit more of a difference than you're already, than you're already making. So uh, we have a number of chit chats coming up through Dyslexia Awareness Month. Next week, I'm going to be chatting uh, with two parents to learn a little bit more and hear about a parent perspective. Um, so I'm sure they're going to offer some great insights uh, for you as well. So really looking forward to connecting with Rebecca and Katrina. But for now, um, good evening, everybody. I hope you're safe and well wherever you are. And thanks again for joining us. And I hope you, that whatever everyone. you're doing um, to raise awareness is going really well. Thank you for the opportunity, Carla.